rest of today's headlines, but first, what do Nihal, Anne and Reese think of schools teaching seven-year-olds the basics of hiding the sausage? Is it too young, too late, or just about right? Uh, email your thoughts to writestuffat5.tv. Ed Balls has been working diligently on improving sex ed in schools uh, for some time and has decided that seven is the right age to teach youngsters the ins and outs. And while parents can currently pull kids out of sex ed classes if they wish, when these new rules come into play in September, and they're going to be law the following year, that opt-out will be removed. Little Peter or Parveen will have to stay in class regardless of their faith or anything else. These lessons for seven-year-olds will focus on the importance of strong relationships and marriage. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but kids will also learn about sperm and eggs and how the two eventually meet. Uh, contraception and sexually transmitted diseases, you're not going to find out about those until later, uh, the first years of secondary school. Uh, Ed Ball says uh, even seven is the right age to talk about... Uh, Oh dear, there he is again. He says seven is the right age to start talking about these sensitive issues. Uh, the proliferation of pornography and explicit storylines on TV means, and this is his argument, that kids need to know more about sex at an earlier age. I think it's fair to say, Anne, that there's plenty of critics out there that say seven is too young, the Family Education Trust being And, of course, them. it depends what you're teaching them at seven. And it depends yeah. whether you're even teaching. I mean, yeah, you, you talked about, you know, hiding the sausage. But by seven, uh, little girls and little boys have noticed that there is a basic difference between yeah. them. And I think it's quite right that they should actually be able to openly discuss it. And if they're not getting open discussion at home, then they should at least no, be getting out? it at school. The opt-out is worrying, but I think maybe the time has come for no opt-out. Yeah. Because I think we, because, I mean, because we all owe it to each other to make sure that all of us have a realistic attitude to sex. And I don't believe in teaching them too much at seven, for heaven's sake, no. But I actually do trust that probably the government guidelines don't advocate teaching them too much at seven. It's just an introduction yeah. to the fact that you can talk about it at all. Mm. Because certainly by the time they leave primary school at 11, they should know most of what needs to be known, okay. I think. I, mean, I think Ed Balls is right. It's a changing world, and we've got to equip them for it. I mean, we, we have to bear in mind that in, in this country recently, we are, we are tops for teen pregnancy. Holland, which has this kind of sex education, uh, is at the bottom of the teen pregnancy lead. Is, is that convincing? Well, I don't think, you know, knowing this at seven isn't going to stop you getting pregnant. You, you don't intend to get pregnant young. I think that's that, uh, you know, yeah. it's accidental. But, but I think that it is the, yeah, the earliest you know, the better. I mean, I think I was, I think at school, I, you know, I didn't get taught it at the primary school, but I was aware in the playground, you know, you talk about it at that age, I'm pretty sure I knew what things were. I remember some of the things, I do clearly remember the first time I heard the words penis and vagina, for example, when I was about seven or eight. Because an older boy asked me if I had a vagina, and I said, yes. And, and, I, and, he, and he laughed, and, and then that was, I remember I was about seven. And that's the time when you go back and you ask the questions. You say, yeah. Mum, Dad, yeah. what is this? You know, I think it's good at seven. And then, you know, if I'd been seven and I had that knowledge, I could have said, I have a, a penis. And then I wouldn't have felt stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you should equip yeah, children with that. Empowering. It's just yeah, creating yeah. the climate where you can talk about these things. So, do, do, Nihal, do you worry that, uh, that if we tell children about sex at seven, they're, they're going to try and put, uh, practice, uh, put it into practice as soon as they can? That they'll all be... No, not no. at all. I mean, this seems... Very, it's scientific, is what they're teaching. It's not, it's not pure in, in any way. I, I worry about the opt-out though, because I think parents that care enough about their children that they don't want them to see this are the kind of parents, hopefully, that would be able to explain and articulate. Really, because I, I think it's just equally possible that the parents who care so much they don't want their kids to be taught yeah. in school are the ones who won't tell their kids. But they also, no, but they also may be the the kind of parents for religious reasons who construct a moral framework around the upbringing of their children and don't wish their children to see this because they believe that moral they have a they have moral, religion framework, the moral framework, ethical framework, mm -hmm. what they're going to be teaching in schools are biological facts. Yeah, and social framework. We're, what we're trying to do is equip children to be part of today's society and not be extraordinary, not be opting out. And I also think if they do opt out anyway, what are the other kids going to think? Well, uh, well that's an interesting point, whether it exposes kids to bullying. But Nihal is right. There are a lot of people out there, we've done phone-ins on this before, it comes through loud and clear that parents feel they're their children and they should be able to choose uh, when they will impart yeah, this kind of information. parents feel that children are growing up you know, far too quickly, as you know, and we, as you said, Ed Balls believes that this is a changing world, but some parents believe that they should have the control yeah. over that, and they can have the control of it. And certainly people that call in my, my phone, in my radio phone-in show, 
do we say, you know, we, we're religious people and we believe that we're teaching them morals where they are not going to go and get pregnant at 15 or 15 Well, then they need to be that. reassured. They, uh, they don't need to read the media headlines for a start because the minute the media talk about something like this, they talk, they talk about children of seven are going yeah. to be taught, taught all about AIDS yeah. and everything. Yeah. And I don't think it is that. They need to be reassured what they are. biological to facts, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, don't forget you can email us your thoughts on this. Write stuff at 5.tv is the address. Kirsty will read out as many as she can. After the break, though, it's Reese with the other headlines, including why we've all become more conservative under Labour and Anne Coyabla, how Calais will be British again, just in case you've forgotten, by 2012. We'll see you on the other side of the ads. <laughs> You're watching The Right Stuff. We're live on five with Anne Diamond, Nihal Arthanaika, and our special guest, Reese Thomas. Uh, in a little bit, uh, mums who poison their kids against dad are following a split, and vice versa. Uh, do bitter splits always lead to bitter child access battles? And what's it like to be the child that's causing the parental crossfire? 0207 173 555. That's some of the thoughts and experiences. But first, Reese, what else is making news? Well, the, head, the top headline in the Daily Telegraph and lots of papers is about um, Kay Gilderdale, who uh, helps assist her daughter's uh, suicide, mm. and she's been acquitted of mm. attempted murder, which obviously is, I think, is a good thing. And, and one of the most important things is that Mr. Justice Bean, who's the you know the the, uh, the, the judge, he, he he praised the jury for the common sense of decency and humanity in acquitting her, which I think is I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that those that jury said no. Yeah. I think what, I mean what you go through the idea that first of all your your daughter or anyone has you know a serious illness to go through the actual attempt the suicide itself and to assist it i mean the details here about what she had to do you know, injecting air into her veins and horrible things like that I, I mean, it must be really bad to go that far you, you've, you've served your sentence in a way you know having to live with this that's so extraordinary though she'd originally been charged with aiding and abetting suicide mm. and it was only keir starmer who's a director of, uh, of public prosecutions that insisted that this go through as, a, as, a, as an attempted murder trial and that was after they'd issued guidelines uh, about assisted suicide. So it was a very odd the sequence said of events. Well, from the beginning, haven't they? they felt that this was a test case? Yes. Uh, and it does feel as though it's been treated that so way, doesn't it? Where does it need to law now? I mean, I'm not any wiser as to... Complete mess, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, because on top of that, the, her actions uh, in the attempt to assist the suicide, none of them actually worked. They, the... The attempted suicide by the daughter was with a morphine poisoning. Uh, she she injected herself and was worried it wasn't enough and then asked mum to do these other things, yeah. none of which killed her. It was the morphine poisoning that killed her. So it was a very odd uh, uh, case. Where it leads, I mean, obviously last week uh, we had the story of the Ingalls, uh, where the woman they got nine years, the mother. It was different. Uh, but it was different because her son couldn't communicate. But right. the... the Fine line, and I, don't know. I think they both acted out of the, from the same place. One of them gets nine years, the other one is cleared, even though there are it's because of the legalities, it's because yeah. of what they're charged with yeah. and what they actually did. And yeah, and you don't feel... go with the Ingalls as well. Uh, the father, the, the uh, girlfriend, they've all stood up and said yes. they support what the mother did, but the law doesn't. It's a strange thing, isn't it? Also, there's always that part of you which would think if I wait another five years. You know, if you, if, uh, you don't know if there's any change. It will also, in terms of medicine and the advancement of, of medicine, do you wait that long? Because you, you never know, there might be a miracle around the corner. I mean, I can't bear the thought. If I mean, you go so abroad and do it, you get prosecuted when you come back. Uh, no, again, you? that's... The, 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 the Keir Starmer's view should have clarified that now. You should be able to go abroad as long as it can be proven that there wasn't any undue pressure so you can catch right, okay. your inheritance. Well, right. Just in case she's watching. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a mess. It's a mess and needs to be revised. Again, I would suggest. Uh, anything else? Well, Tony Blair, as you've seen in your uh, question, uh, has, uh, earns up to £400,000. Uh, he's done three talks, right? And he's earned £300,000. Uh, oh, yeah, he's going to, isn't he? Yeah. He's going to earn this. And this is to, to do with the, you know, um, for this hedge fund that he goes up there. Now, they backed you up. They backed on Northern Rock that's going right. down the Swanee, made a fortune out of that, and then can hire Tony Blair uh, at £100,000 at all. But what I think about, I mean, let's forget that for a minute. I do think that Tony Blair, as Prime Minister... Um, how much is it? Sixty-four thousand pounds a year. They get about one hundred and eighty. Is it? Prime yeah, really? yeah, you change your mind now. You think okay. he's done enough, don't you? No, I still think it's. I think if he makes that amount of money after he's served his term, then fair enough. Oh, he's made. He's made fifteen million since well, he's left. But he's so fifteen million. Just to remind ourselves, fifty million socialist pounds. Obviously, right. as a Labour prime minister. But it is, it is a hard job. Is yeah. <laughs> 